what is history? Unlike the question, what is art? Here we don't really have an object in front of us. Because isn't history always in the past? Isn't it the nature of history that it's no longer in front of us? When you say, oh, that's ancient history, you're saying that something doesn't affect you anymore and that it's behind you, right? So this means when we ask the question, what is history? The only means we have to answer it is indirectly, namely through the things that survive and come out of history, like oral traditions, written documents, and yes, works of art. All these things are witnesses in our present to a time in the past. Maybe then art objects are like the stars in the night sky. When you see stars in the sky, you're seeing the light they emitted many light years in the past. Sometimes the stars, which are suns, are no longer even there anymore, the big ones having collapsed into black holes. Like the light from a star somewhere in the past, works of art come down to us, are preserved in museums, but their historical moment is long gone. They're what we can see and study from a past that's no longer here, maybe not light years in the past, but often centuries. It's really interesting to think of cultural time this way. But actually, that's not quite right. There are holes in this analogy between starlight and works of art. The biggest problem is that we didn't make any of those stars in the universe. Art objects, on the other hand, were made by human hands and minds. Stars in different galaxies have very little to do with us. Art objects, however, have very much to do with us. We can think of art history as a collective past of making and thinking that still informs our present forms of making and thinking. Look all around you the next time you're walking down New York City, and almost everything you see is connected to some cultural past. This leads us to a very profound thought. Unlike stars, which we found, observed, and discovered, history is also found, observed, and discovered, but if you think about it, it's also made by us. After all, human history has been passed down in all sorts of ways, by telling stories, by writing, and through art and architecture. But who gets to tell stories? Who gets to write? Who gets to be an artist? Another way to say this is, who gets to make history? This is incredibly important, because how history has been made and formed has been shaped by all sorts of human decisions and limitations. Think of the current debates about history books in the high school curriculum, especially when it comes to the history of slavery in the United States. Some want to downplay this past, while others want to make sure future generations are informed about the cruel realities of slavery and its foundational role for this country. This is why thinking about historical method is so crucial. An anti-racist view of history will see it from the position of those who have been discriminated against according to skin pigmentation. A feminist view of history will see it from the position of the condition of women. A leftist view of history will see it from the position of the working class. A decolonial view of history will see history from the position of the struggle against imperialism and colonial aggression. These are all relatively new historical methods, but they're essential correctives to the way history has been written, which has overwhelmingly been by a white, male, European, and upper-class perspective, though not always. Until recently, this has def definitely been the way art history has been written. This all means that history is always a struggle of different positions and viewpoints. For is it really possible to write history from a completely neutral position? Don't we all have biases and prejudices? Think back to our last session and our discussion about ideology. It also means that history is constantly being written and rewritten, no? This gets us to another profound point about history, which bears directly on our study of art. When we look at the light of a star, all those light years in the past, we don't really change that star. Other than the fact that we're observing its light trail, it remains unaltered. Yet the same can't really be said about artworks. First of all, when an art object is in front of you in the present, say in a museum, it isn't completely the same object it was when it was made, for the simple reason that it's lost its original cultural context. And I don't simply mean that parts of, the objects have been, ha, parts of the object have been worn away over time or degraded, which does happen. What I mean is that without the ideas and the ways of living that generated the object all those years ago, 
it's lost something conceptually. In other words, it's lost some of its meaning. Imagine far off in the future, us humans are long gone. Among all the other interesting human artifacts laying around, an alien visitor finds an iPhone. This alien visitor might be able to figure out how to turn it back on. They might even be able to understand how it works, and they might be able to figure out what it was used for, mainly information. But would they really know everything about the cultural and economic impacts of these devices in our current time? Would they really know what they meant to its users? Probably not. Now, there are two very important outcomes from all these thoughts and hypotheticals I've given you. One, it's always possible that some aspects of an artwork will be forever lost to us, forever unretrievable in the past. So this means that, two, we sometimes have to make compelling guesses and conjectures with what's available to us. But remember what I was saying a moment ago. Every time we look and, interp and interpret an armed object, we change it, even if just a little bit. We recode it. We reinterpret it. And we see the object from our present moment with all our abilities and presuppositions. To understand this better, let me make another analogy. We probably all have a song that we listen to during a difficult moment in our lives. Say a breakup song. We haven't listened to the song in a long time. Maybe it was just too hard to revisit the song. But what happens when we eventually do listen to it again? Well, this might vary from person to person, but I think we both re-experience the emotions from the past, but we also write over them. Whatever pain that was associated with the song has subsided, and we listen to the song with a fresh heart and ears. But then doesn't this unavoidably change the way we experience and interpret the song? Doesn't it begin to mean something else or get added onto? I think practicing history works in similar ways. Every time we look and study an object from the past, we recode it and reconsider it, and it changes in the eyes of our present moment. And this can be a very good thing, because history has a way of affecting not only the present, but also the future, and it can be written and practiced in such, in such a way that leads to a better future for everybody. Okay, so much for this theoretical introduction, which was necessary for such a complicated question like, what is history? Now let's turn to some objects. In the following, we'll concentrate on artworks that are in history, but also have something to do with history. In other words, history is part of their content and theme. Let's start with the relatively recent history of Western painting from the 19th and 20th centuries. This is a painting by Eugène Delacroix who was one of the most important French painters during the period of Romanticism. As a 19th century art movement, Romanticism privileged emotions and visceral themes and imagery. This painting, Liberty, Liberty Leading the People, documents the three-day revolution of Paris in 1830 that overthrew Charles X. The central bare-breasted figure is a personification of freedom. She's wearing what's called a Phrygian cap which is what emancipated slaves in antiquity wore that the French revolutionaries took up as their own symbol of resistance. Incidentally, this is called an allegory, which was when an object, person, or story stands in for some other idea. She's clearly urging the people forward over the barricade and a slew of dead bodies, and notice the two figures on the left of the painting. One looks like he comes from the working class, while the other looks to be from the wealthier class of owners what's called the bourgeoisie. In this way, Delacroix is conveying democratic principles and socialist ideals of a classless society. So, this painting is about a historical event in 1830, but it's also a painting that tells us something about the history of Western painting itself. There are a number of ways that Delacroix's work pushes the boundaries of what painting could be at the time. For example, normally paintings of this size, it's nearly 11 feet wide, would be reserved for mythological scenes or events that happened way off in the past. This was called history painting. Here, however, you're seeing a contemporary event. It was painted in the same year as the Revolution. So this was definitely something new. Delacroix's painterly style was also new. While it's a naturalistic scene, notice how you can see his brush strokes, and this is especially noticeable in person. This adds a certain amount of energy and movement. Notice also his, his strong use of color, which is usually thought to be Delacroix's key innovation in painting. 
especially the burst of red of the French flag that gets echoed by the red fabric around the waist of the figure who's looking up to Lady Liberty. In all these ways, Delacroix was breaking with established conventions. He was pushing the envelope of what art could be. And we have a term for this, which, fittingly enough, comes from military history. The avant-garde. The avant-garde literally means those at the front, as in those artists who sought to be the first and to go beyond their predecessors. This is a key feature of, the, of Western modern art history, which has always tried to move forward into new terrain. Our next step in this history of avant-garde painting is Henri Matisse. Along with Picasso, he's probably the most important Western painter at the beginning of the 20th century. And I think you can already tell, he's really taken Delacroix's use of color to new heights here. This is his celebrated The Joy of Life, which taps into the pastoral tradition of painting. Pastoral scenes are those that show you idyllic views of nature and rural life, with gods and humans generally having a good time. This work is also about the history of painting itself. Matisse has inserted all sorts of references to previous works of art, from the Renaissance all the way back to Paleolithic imagery. Notice the goats being herded by the shepherd on the right. They seem to double as cave paintings, don't they? It's as if he took motifs from the past and updated them with his own transgressive style of striking colors, big areas of oranges and yellows, and color that often doesn't even match reality. The figures themselves are also an assault on Western tradition. Notice how he's destabilized gender differences. Before this, the history of Western art has always been clear as to what figures are male and what figures are female. Matisse, however, has blurred these boundaries. So here too, we have an artist that sought to push painting forward by pushing the envelope as part of this Western avant-garde tra uh, tradition that we're tracing. The next painting by Mond Mondrian goes even further. Now we've entered the completely non-objective realm. This is completely abstract, or more specific, specifically, it's called geometric abstraction. Now painting has been pushed to its limits. Not, don't, not only does it no longer represent the world outside, which really goes against the history of Western painting, but it lays bare its own operations and principles. By this, I mean that Mondrian is showing you the basic foundation of painting, line, composition, flatness, and color. And it's not a coincidence that he's using the three primary colors here, which are red, blue, and yellow, from which all other colors can be made. Going back to our physics analogy, like the physicists at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland who researched the elementary particles of our universe, Mondrian is showing you the elementary properties of painting. But that's not all. Through his paintings, Mondrian thought that he was showing us how history itself works. He was influenced by the 19th century German philosopher Hegel, who claimed that history moves forward by continually resolving tensions and contradictions. Mondrian is using this notion of history as a basis for the way he painted. Notice how his canvas, this one right here, composition with yellow, blue, and green, isn't symmetrical in its geometric shapes and, 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 um, and order and, and, and privilege. The color sizes are different. And while it's, it's all right angles, none of the squares and rectangles seem to match. And yet for all these differences, which you'd think would create visual attention or even contradiction, everything is perfectly balanced. Everything is in its right place and each element plays off the rest. What seems so simple at first is actually quite remarkable. And I could give you tons of other examples, but these three paintings by Delacroix, Matisse, and Mondrian give you a good sense of the modern Western conception of painting as continually, continually moving forward in a type of one-upsmanship. But is this the only way we can understand art history? Is this the only way we can understand history as a linear forward progress? There are other conceptions of history available to us. Take a look at this object from the 11th century in India. Here we have a depiction of Shiva, which according to Hinduism, dances the cosmos into existence. This type of sculpture is called Shiva Nataraja, one of many different manifestations of Shiva. With one of his four limbs, he holds a drum that represents creation, or maybe better, brings creation into being through sound. With another hand, he makes the fear not mudra, 
A mudra is a hand gesture that holds a specific meaning. You'll also often see Buddhist figures making these hand gestures. While he dances, he steps on a demon who personifies ignorance. One of the names for this demon is amnesia. So hold on to that thought. But Shiva doesn't just create, he also destroys. In his extended left hand, he holds the fire of destruction. This means that this statue represents a cyclical notion of existence, one where things are constantly created and destroyed, creation and destruction going hand in hand. This cyclical theme is also represented by the ring of fire that frames Shiva, which symbolizes the boundaries of the universe and the idea of samsara. Samsara is the cycle of birth, death, and reincarnation that you'll also find in Buddhism. But what's even more interesting here is that this statue of Shiva offers a competing, notion, a competing notion of history to the Western linear version we described above. It's not history as a straight line, but history as a circle. This notion of history is more attuned to the natural world and all its cycles. I mean, just think of the seasons. There's an ecologist, his name's Stephen Pine, uh, who's written beautifully about this statue from this context. Let me quote his text um, in, in the following way. Considered ecologically, this Nataraja statue expresses in graphic language the great polarity of India, the annual alternation of wet and dry seasons by which the monsoon, with faint transition, imposes its opposing principles on the subcontinent. India's biota, like Shiva, dances to their pe peculiar rhythm while fire turns the timeless wheel of the world. And so it's as if history and time sways with the currents of the more than human world, of nature, of the great outdoors, or we could even say that climate itself is history in this case. To, su to, to lose sight of this then is like having amnesia, a forgetting of time and history that leads to ignorance. And hopefully you, had, you held on to that detail of the demon uh, named Amnesia being trampled on by Shiva. Let's look at another object that gives us a, that also gives us a different conception of history than the modern Western, Western linear version. This is a wonderful partition screen that comes from the Clinket people in Alaska. It's a beautiful example of art from the Pacific Northwest, where designs are impeccable and so satisfying to the eye. Notice the perfect sense of balance and symmetry but without looking at all stiff or fussy. You have shapes within shapes. Notice how the figure in front of you reappears twice as smaller figures inside each ear. You have thick lines that suddenly get thicker and thinner and curve so gracefully. You can tell that the Clinket people are master wood carvers and that they're known for their carvings of totem poles and canoes. The color palette is a traditional use of red and black. While this object is now in the Denver Art Museum, it once belonged to chief sheikhs of the Nanyai tribe. This partition screen was used to set off the clan leader's sleeping area. The figure is a bear, which was the totem animal of this family. It was the family crest. Legend has it that two grizzly bears escaped flooding by climbing up a mountain. One of them was killed and then worn during family ceremonies. Another legend is that a family ancestor was once carried away by a bear and forced to marry a female bear. This is an animist tradition where humans and animals often morph and change into each other in spiritual kinship. This ancestor escaped and then used the bear as the family crest. Whatever the case may be, what you're seeing here is the visual representation of a non-Western history. It's not a history of changing styles or of relentlessly breaking with tradition like the Western avant-garde. It's about the preservation of a mythic past that serves to conserve the cultural present. It's significant that the leader of the family would enter through the hole in the partition, which is strategically located to call to mind the womb and the birth canal. This, of course, symbolizes life and traditional lineages. But it also serves to show that the Klingit society is matriarchal. In other words, women hold most of the power. It's men who marry into other families, and identities are formed on the mother's side, not the father's side. Since Western history is so overwhelming, overwhelmingly patriarchal, it might be interesting to think of an alternate reality where Western history had been ruled by women. How would it have changed? How would it have turned out differently over all these centuries? But an even more interesting question. Now that we live in a global world, especially economically, 
We tend to think that all humanity is on the same historical course, that there's a global history. But what if around the world there are traditions that try to keep this, this global history at a distance in order to preserve their local and non-Western cultural histories? Do you think it's a good thing for all peoples to enter in the same global history? Or should we think of the world as having multiple histories that may sometimes come into contact with each other, but that also maintain their differences? Well, these are some major questions to think about. But let's leave that question aside for now and look at examples of artworks that document historical events, sometimes in order to memorialize them. In a sense, these objects write history through images. This is one of four amazing mural paintings by Aaron Douglas, one of the key figures of the Harlem Renaissance, a movement that sought to convey the black experience in the United States through art, poetry, music, literature, and philosophy beginning in the 1930s. These, mu these murals are in the Schomburg Center in Harlem. This is the second panel, which depicts the history of slavery in the South through the Reconstruction period. Douglas's references the Civil War, uh, with soldiers far off in the distance. In the foreground, the image is filled with cotton plants. This provides a wonderful sense of depth with green shoots and vivid white pops of color. But more importantly, cotton represents the staple crop that fueled the slave economy and allowed the United States to enter the global economy, which in many ways provided a rationale for the horrible practice of slavery itself. The end of the Civil War is represented by the Emancipation Proclamation, being read by the figure at the right with a hat. Notice the concentric circles of light that emanate from the document. The figure in the center, who seems to be pointing forward in our direction, also holds a document. It could be the Emancipation Proclamation again, or it could be the Constitution, which includes the 13th Amendment banning slavery in 1865, or it could be a voting ballot, referencing the 15th Amendment right for all citizens to vote, regardless of race. Unfortunately, along with the great promise of equality and opportunity during Reconstruction and the end of slavery, white supremacy reared its ugly head, lynching and Jim Crow laws that segregated society. Douglas included the Ku Klux Klan storming in with white batons and horses at the left of this painting. So what he's giving us in one incredible visual swoop is not only the broken promises of the post-Civil War period, but also a reminder of the founding ideals of this country. Douglas was working during the Great Depression and its aftermath in the 1930s. This was the moment of FDR's New Deal that helped the country recover from the economic crash. Part of the New Deal was putting artists back to work, including photographers enlisted to document the plight of the poor, especially in rural America. Here's probably the most famous example. This is Dorothea Lange's Migrant Mother, an amazing pho photograph that shows you a moment in time of two children with their heads turned back and their mother looking forward to a very uncertain future. She was a pea picker in California living in a camp of field workers. Her name was Florence Owens Thompson. When the crops froze, so did their income, which led to famine. It's a powerful image, and if you think about it, what better tool to document history than photography? Unlike painting, drawing, or sculpture, which are far more conditioned by the mind and the hand of the artist, photography is more objective. You're getting a real moment in history. Yes, historical documentation through photographs is incredibly important. But then again, we shouldn't think that photography is completely objective. Photographers always make certain decisions, choosing the right moment, framing this moment, and interpreting it in some way. In fact, Thompson didn't like this photograph of her. She said it wasn't completely truthful about the conditions at the time, and she also resented the fact that it was published without her consent. I suppose some photographs are so strong and iconic that they take on a life of their own, become, becoming history themselves, leaving behind both the artist's and the sitter's intentions. Here's another celebrated artwork from this period that also deals with a specific historical event. This is Picasso's very famous mural, Guernica which is named after a town in Spanish Basque country that was bombed by the, Frank by the Franco dictatorship with the help of Hitler's Condor Legion of Bombers. It was one of the first instances of targeting civilians, just everyday people, children included, who were just at a market. It caused international uproar, 
Picasso decided to memorialize this tragic event in monumental terms. I mean, this mural is over 11 feet high and 26 feet wide. Unlike Lang's realistic photograph, Picasso used his cubist abstract style in bleak grays, blacks, and whites to convey the horror, sadness, violence, and mourning. Notice the mother holding her dead child screaming to the heavens just below the bull figure at the far left. It'd be interesting to compare this mother with Lang's migrant mother. There's a wonderful story associated with this work, which unfortunately isn't, probably isn't true, but one day in Paris, when it was being occupied by the Nazis during World War II, the Gestapo, the secret police, raided Picasso's apartment, and one of the policemen found a postcard of his painting, of this very Guernica. He then turned to the artist and asked him, did you do this? Picasso just responded, no, you did. Okay, so I've shown you three works that deal with historical violence, Douglas's, Lang's, and Picasso's. This, this gets us to an interesting question about art, namely, what can it do in the face of such historical violence? What can art do in the face of disaster? After World War II and the Holocaust, where six million Jews, Roma, disabled people, and gay people, among other ethnic minorities, were gathered up and murdered in concentration camps, the German philosopher Theodor, Theodor Adorno made a famous and much debated claim, namely that writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. Auschwitz is the name of one of the concentration camps in German. What do you think he meant by this? One way it's been interpreted is to say that after such a horrific historical trauma, the liquidation and systematic killing of people on an unimaginable scale, humanity had just lost its right to enjoy anything beautiful, not only the beauty of poetry, but also of visual art. This is like a collective historical loss of innocence. Another interpretation is to say that some historical tragedies just can't be depicted, either out of respect for the victims, or because they're such massive events that they're truly unrepresentable even if an artist tried. This delicate consideration of the role art has in the face of tragedy informs a number of artists after World War II. Here are two examples that sought to negotiate art and historical trauma. This is a painting by Anselm Kiefer one of the most celebrated German painters of the post-war period. He was part of a group of painters called the Neo-Expressionists of the 1980s. I think the painting can best be described as charred earth from which nothing will ever grow again. When you see a Kiefer painting up close in person, you'll see mountains of paint, but also other materials like dirt, hay, and sand. In this instance, you get a rough-looking road that leads, to a, that leads to a very high horizon line. And notice how this makes the painting feel closed and landbound, maybe even a little oppressive for the viewer. The title refers to a city near Berlin that had a concentration camp, and more generally in German history, was an area that had seen a lot of warfare, a lot of fighting. Scrawled on the road in black cursive are the words Markisch Heid, referring to the title of a traditional song about the Brandenburg countryside that the Nazis would use as a marching song. Kiefer often made work that directly confronted German history and the events of World War II, which, at the time in the 1970s and 80s, the German public had yet to fully deal with this horrifying history. Kiefer doesn't show you the camps themselves, or emaciated and dead bodies, or even any fighting. He just gives you a somber, barren landscape, perhaps as a space to remember and mourn. But what do you think? Is this a painting that, dread, that treads a difficult history with care? Or do you see it as sensationalist? Or as a painting that shouldn't be trying to do what it's trying to do? We can have a similar conversation about Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. This is one of the most acclaimed memorials. Instead of trying to represent a real event, soldiers or even the war itself, Lin's memorial is a masterclass in profound simplicity. It's made of two long pieces of black granite that enter into the ground in a V-shape. In total, it's some 500 feet long. 58,272 names have been carved in the granite. 
the names of all the American soldiers killed or missing during the Vietnam War. The names are ordered chronologically, starting in 1956 and ending in 1968. Since the casualties continued to rise over these 12 years, the effect is that the memorial gets taller and taller as time moves forward with more names added. While this is one of the most acclaimed memorials now, when it was first proposed, a lot of people voiced their dislike. They thought it was a big gash in the ground, and they didn't like the completely abstract and conceptual approach that Lynn took. And it is a radical departure from the way war and history have often been memorialized. For a good example, just nearby, you have the Marine Corps Memorial from 1954, which is usually better known as the Iwo Jima Memorial, which is emphatically about patriotism, war, and sacrifice. It's completely clear. By contrast, the Vietnam Memorial is ambivalent about war. What I mean by, by this is that there's no clear patriotic celebration of soldiers or U.S. intervention in another country. I think the most important aspect of this memorial is that there's nothing heroic about it. It's a somber list of names carved in a wall of black granite. Perhaps this, this approach, which is completely non-representational and non-sensationalizing, fits with, with what we've just been talking about in regards to Adorno's famous phrase and quote about poetry. In this sense, I think we can trace a direct line from Lynn's memorial made in the early 1980s to the National September 11 Memorial at the World Trade Center in New York, with its two reflective pools and named carved, carved in bronze, which is equally austere, though highly emotional, in its non-representational simplicity. We have a couple more works to talk about, which will take us in different historical directions. One thing we haven't talked about is conservation, which is really important, because this is how historical objects are preserved. In museums, there are whole departments trained in conserving often quite fragile works of art. This will, also, this will also involve restoration, which means fixing any sudden damages, as when a work of art has been altered by someone or disfigured during war, or slow damages that build up over time, especially pollution. Recently, the Rijksmuseum in Holland has undertaken a high-profile restoration of one of the most celebrated Western paintings, Rembrandt's The Night Watch. Almost a century after it was painted, someone cut all four sides of the, of the canvas so, so it could fit into a new building. Even worse, the strips that got cut were never to be seen again. In order to restore these missing pieces of the painting, the museum did something unprecedented. They used artificial intelligence, what's called a convolution neural network, to recreate Rembrandt's style of painting, especially his use of color and brushstrokes. Essentially, through this AI algorithm, a very powerful computer was taught how to paint like a famous artist who's been dead for some time. This is incredible. By comparing the restored night watch with copies that had been made of it before it was cut, the museum could confirm the success of the computer's rendering. It's an amazing achievement. I can't help but think, though, that these scientific advancements in restoration will lead to some thorny ethical questions, like... In the future, will it be possible for computers to repaint lost or destroyed works of art and then credit the authorship to the original artist? Or going even further, could museums create completely new works of art through artificial intelligence that effectively reincarnates the brain, eye, and hands of a famous painter in the past, like Rembrandt? This all sounds like science fiction, but we don't seem to be that far off. I'll leave you with one last wrinkle having to do with history. We've talked about history as a human practice and the way we see ourselves back in time through objects. But is there a non-human history? By this I mean a history before us humans came along to write or make works of art. Our planet was formed some 4.5 billion years ago, well before human history. What was history then? And maybe another way of putting it, what was time then? Was there time then? These are questions for philosophy and physics, and I certainly won't be able to answer them here, but I do want to mention a fascinating physicist named Carlo Rovelli. He's written a lot about how time works, and one of the things he points out is that time as we know it wouldn't exist without entropy. Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics that says the world always moves towards disorder and randomness. Another way of saying this is through the processes of heating and cooling. 
As Ravelli tells us, heat passes only from hot bodies to cold, never the other way around. Like the universe, our solar system, and every physical thing around us, entropy dictates that energy will dissipate and become disordered. A simple example being a perfectly square ice cube that slowly melts into an undifferentiated pool of water. What Ravelli says next is really a bit mind-blowing. He says that the only reason we experience time as forward movement, of which we can't go back, is through this entropic law that heat passes to cold and never the other way around. It's the only thing that's irreversible, according to Ravelli. The last artist we talk about today was also fascinated by entropy and the gradual disorder of the material world. He was also fascinated by non-human timescales, like the age of our Earth, which if you think about it, 4.5 billion years old is really hard to wrap your mind around. This was Robert Smithson, one of the great land artists of the 1960s and 70s. Land art, or what are sometimes called earthworks, involved leaving the gallery or museum altogether and making very large sculptures with and in the landscape. His most famous earthwork you're seeing now, the spiral jetty. This is a massive work that he made using bulldozers and other machinery out in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. If you can somehow unfold and straighten the spiral, it'd be 15 feet across and 1,500 feet long. From this distance, if you were standing on it, you'd only be a small mark. Smithson was as interested in the shape of his work and the environment as he was in the implications of time taking over, almost becoming the next author of the work after him. Over these last few decades, the lake and the sculpture has entered into all sorts of irreversible changes, freezing, melting, flooding, drying up, and generally entering into the slow breaking down of the spiral, in other words, entropy, something that will likely take centuries if not more. So you see, Smithson was calling attention to, its, to a time scale and a history that is, in part, non-human. Maybe we can think of this type of work as part human history and part geological history. Well, we started this session talking about stars and ended with the time of the Earth. And in between, we considered various ways of understanding and approaching human history and visual culture. I hope you've gained a new appreciation for the complexity of history and, that's, and then it's giving you a lot of interesting things to think about. Next session will be a little bit more humble in scope. We'll consider how mundane, everyday objects tell us a lot about different cultures and times past, which, of course, continue to affect our present and future.